There really are two selves within each and every one of us. Um, Muktananda called the ego, the part of us that has edge got out, E-G-O, edge got out, the false self. And the false self is uh, this part of us that is not authentic. It is, um, it is the ego. This false self is the part of us that is always trying to, trying to win, trying to own things, trying to prove itself. We send our kids off to school and we tell them, you know, be ahead of everybody else, win, no matter what, and so on. And, and they have a tendency just to believe that who they are are these bodies, even though the body they're in is going to change and you'll never be able to find it again. And then there's within each and every one of us a higher self. And this higher self is, um, is really the soul, it's really the spirit, it's really, it's really God. But these two selves are sort of constantly at, they're not at war so much with each other, but there's, uh, there's this battleground that we have within us. I'll give you an example of it in my own life. Um, somebody on the internet, a guy named Watkins, has put out a list, because there's lists for everything the 100 most spiritually influential people alive and they put out this list 100 people and they rank from number one to 100 and I'm on the list not only am I on the list but I am according to this list and they've got all this criteria how you get on this list I am the third most spiritually influential person alive so the spiritual part of myself, my soul, the higher place within myself, um, says to me, this is not relevant. <laughs> You're not any better than anybody else, just because somebody has put you on a list. In fact, you shouldn't even be, cons you shouldn't even know about that list. And perhaps the people who are most spiritually influential aren't even on that list and don't even want to be on that list because they don't care about those kind of rankings and comparisons and so on. But then there's the ego over here that says, what do you mean number three? Well, what's going on with that? And who are these people who are more spiritually influential than you? And how are you going to take them down? It shouldn't make any difference. Who I am is, uh, you know, is the same as everyone else. We all come from the same place and we all return back to the same place. But. Um, then the ego says, let's see, the two people ahead of me on this list, one of them is Eckhart Tolle, <laughs> but he had Oprah, and he got on there every week, and that's not fair, so, and then there's the Dalai Lama, <laughs> and I figure Eckhart and I maybe can get together and take the Dalai Lama out of this thing, <laughs> or maybe I should align with the Dalai Lama, and uh, anyway, the ego is doing this, um, this number on us but there's also the part of us that is divine and this is the place that I'm addressing here in this program there's a quote from Joel Goldsmith uh, Joel wrote so many great books a parenthesis in eternity was one of them and this is what Joel said he said then there are those who reach a stage in which they realize the futility of this constant striving and struggling for the things that perish, things which after they are obtained prove to be shadows. It is at this stage that some persons turn from this seeking for things in the outer realm to a seeking for them from God. And that's who you tuned into today on this program. I have left this uh, pursuing things and money and fame and winning and being better than others it's taken me a while but it has been it has been a a powerful journey as a matter of fact i had said to uh, my ex-wife um <clears throat> i said can you imagine did you ever in your wildest dreams could you ever have imagined that you would be married to the third most spiritually influential person alive <laughs> And she said, I just, she said, they didn't call me when they made that list. And she said also, she said, I don't want to um, upset you, dear. 
But you're not in my wildest dreams. All right. <laughs> so moving to this higher place is, uh, is really um, understanding that in, in the second chapter of um, Wishes Fulfilled, uh, I call it the higher self. And it gets defined very specifically by this great Bulgarian teacher. His name was Omram Mikhail Ivanov. And he, he was teaching what's called the initiatic sciences. And I have had um, his teachings show up in my life in a very powerful way. I've studied his uh, writing. I've listened to many of his recorded lectures uh, that took place back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, I, I brought a quote of his that I'd like to share with you. Our higher self is perfect, omniscient, and almighty. A fragment of God himself. A pure, transparent, luminous quintessence. I love that. I love great writing like that. And that within each and every one of us, there is a place inside of each and every one of us that is all-knowing, that is almighty, that is actually a fragment of God. He then went on to say, the creator has planted within every creature a fragment of himself, a spark, a spirit, of the same nature of himself and thanks to this spirit every creature can become a creator and this means that instead of always waiting for their needs to be satisfied by some external source human beings can absolutely work inwardly by means of their own thoughts their own will and their own spirit to obtain nourishing healing elements that they need this is why he said to all of us, the teaching I bring to you is of the spirit of the creator and not of matter. A spark, a spark that is in each and every one of us. And <clears throat> this spark, I want you to be able to recognize because that spark, I'd like to see you have it grow from just a tiny little spark, which means you can hardly see it to a fragment, to a piece, to a larger chunk, if you will, to a section, so that this spark within you that you see up here is growing and growing and growing until it absolutely becomes even more than you imagined. T.S. Eliot, the great American poet, said, we shall not cease from exploration, but at the end of all of our exploring will be to return to the place from which we originated, but to know it for the first time. I paraphrase that, it's awful little. To know it for the first time. I think that T.S. Eliot might have been speaking about that, but I'm not. I think that we can come to know this place from which we originated, the place to which we return, all of us, by allowing this spark to become something bigger than just an occasional thing where you extend an act of kindness someplace or you have it at the church or at the mosque or at the synagogue on a holy day or a holy observance, that it can become your way of being. There was a great teacher in India his name was Vivekananda. Vivekananda came to the West as a, uh, as a young teacher, a very profound teacher. And he was asked the question, but how do you do this? How do you, how do you access this higher self? How do you make this your reality? And he said these words to his devotees, and I say them to you. He said, in the springtime, go out and observe the blossoms on the fruit trees. He said, the blossoms vanish of themselves as the fruit grows. And so too will the lower self, the false self, the ego, vanish as the divine grows within you. 
It's about allowing yourself to recognize you must have this spark because this is what you came from and this is what you return to. And as this spark becomes a fragment and becomes a section and becomes larger and larger, you reach what I call in Wishes Fulfilled, the third chapter, the highest self. And what is the highest self? This is the one that's going to surprise you a bit. The highest self is the self that you haven't been trained to believe in. You've been trained to believe in your ordinary awareness. Your highest self is where you begin to recognize your connection to your source. To change the thought from notice me, notice me, to what Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu calls living in obscurity, becoming more obscure. We live in a uh, celebrity-obsessed world, don't we? Look at me. Notice me. The Tao teaches something completely the opposite. Listen to the 66th verse of the Tao. Water again. The sea stays low. And because the sea stays low, all of the rivers and all of the streams empty into it because it stays humble, because it stays in that place of just allowing everything to come to you. He was trying to teach us the important lesson of uh, letting what we know is coming come to us. Verse 66 of the Tao. Why is the sea king of a hundred streams? Because it lies below them. Humility gives it its power. That's a very important principle to understand. And I live on the ocean, right next to it. It's my front yard. And always I watch it to learn something from this thing called the ocean, which is the most powerful source of life that we have on the planet. Without it, there's no life on this planet. And because it stays low, so what does this have to say to us? Do you have the capacity to get past that ego need to always be saying, notice me, look how important I am. I mean, there's been a proliferation of this lately with this celebrity silly stuff, isn't it? I mean, CNN is doing, you know, full hour shows on, uh, on silly little things about what happened to this particular celebrity or what happened to that celebrity, and the celebrity's never even done anything. And it's, uh, there's all of this talk about it. And all of the new magazines, I mean, and you look, you go into, through an airport and you look on the newsstand and all the same photos, just with different magazines. I don't even know what, what the names of all of them are, but there's like this huge market now that we have for people to get into a state of notice me, notice me, notice me. And how much do we train our young people, particularly in our schools and so on, that the one who is the star is the one who gets the most attention. The one who is uh, the most important and the most valuable is the one that has uh, the most people liking them and so on. This constant obsession with needing to be noticed. When in fact, what I have found for myself is the, the happiest moments of my life are when I can do it low and slow and not have anybody out there even know what I'm doing. To be able to, I mean, Louise never would have uh, advertised the fact of some of the things I talk about with her generosity. She does it anonymously. It's almost always done in those ways. No, look at me, look and notice me, how important I am and so on. So much to learn from that kind of wisdom, from that kind of inner connection to the Tao, the ability and the willingness to say, to do it anonymously to say that you can just get done almost anything that you want to get done if you don't become obsessed with taking credit for it. In the 36th verse of the Tao Te Ching, it says, the gentle outlast the strong, the obscure outlast the obvious. Try to become a little more obscure, a little less interfering, a little less notice me, a little less, you know, one of the specific kinds of things that you can do is just as you're about, when somebody else is talking, just as you're about to interject what you've been thinking about for the whole time, waiting for them to stop talking, 
just to, to just stop and to bite your tongue and say, tell me more. Or, that's very interesting. I have never heard that point of view before. Even if they totally, completely disagree with everything that you stand for, to be, to be willing to listen, to be able to stop, practice it. I practiced it when I did these verses of the Tao. I practiced it every single day while I was working on that. Just staying obscure. And for me, that's not always so easy because of just being recognized wherever I go. And if I saw someone who was about to recognize me, I would just put my head down. I would just walk a little bit past them like something. Right now, I just want to be anonymous. Right now, I want to be obscure. The Tao says, storms always end. Verse 23, fierce winds don't blow all morning. A downpour of rain doesn't last all day. Who does this? Heaven and earth. You're already connected to everything you want or need. It will come to you at the exact perfect time as the rivers and the streams come to the ocean at the perfect time and place. You've got to trust. You've got to know it's going to come to you. You don't have to chase after it. You can become a little less obsessed with your ego and your self-importance and who you are and what you've done and you can get so much more done and you know what it's the most peaceful and sweet delicious way it's like the song that Cecilia was singing about the rose thank you so much and God bless you, thank you. line by uh, Albert Einstein when he was talking to his students about trying to solve mathematical problems and equations. He said, you can't ever solve a problem with the same mind that created it. It's, it's what they call sometimes in management circles uh, thinking outside of the dots or outside of the box. Getting out of your comfort zone. Getting out of... Um, looking at things the way you've always looked at them and having a different kind of an awareness. I came across this quote not too long ago. Moving away the clouds does not make the sunshine. It merely reveals what was hidden all along. The sunshine, the sun is always there and you don't make it shine by just taking things away. There's something inside all of us that is hidden. And it's the ability to, uh, I call it rewriting our agreement with reality. It requires a new kind of awareness, a different a willingness, if you will, to... Uh, to see yourself as potentially capable of virtually anything. I've always loved the observation from the New Testament of, of Jesus that even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. That within each and every one of us there is this ability to to be healers. There's this ability to be able to manifest and attract anything into our lives that we put our attention on. There's this ability to live at such a high level of consciousness that we can uh, transcend our bodies. My internal wiring has always been one of uh, whatever it is that I've got in my life as a problem that I have to take responsibility for it, but I also have the capacity to be able to change it. And not only to change around what it is that is not working for me, but also to change around what I have been attracting into my life. I think it begins with this, uh, this whole idea of, uh, of being inspired. I've always liked that word, inspired, inspiration, because its origin is in spirit. And then the opposite word is uh, uh, being informed. And so when you're in form, in the physical world, when you're in form, you get information, you get lots of information. And this is what we call the information age.
right? So there's no shortage of information. They say that on a, a little chip the size of your thumbnail, we can put the names and addresses of everybody in the United States and Canada on, on a little chip the size of your thumbnail. That's really more information, I think, than we need. <laughs> What we are doing is we are moving from the age of information to the age of inspiration, I believe. And as we move into the age of inspiration, where collectively mankind is beginning to have uh, a collective capacity to be able to think thoughts which empower us rather than which weaken us, which, uh, according to Hawkins' research, uh, up until about 1985 or 1986, collectively, mankind's collective thoughts uh, always produced uh, that which weakens us. And now, in the last few years, we have moved above the level uh, where man's collective consciousness is uh, at least at a place where collectively we are empowering ourselves rather than uh, using force. And as we move into the world of inspiration, we have to understand what that means. And Patanjali had a wonderful observation. I wrote about it in Wisdom of the Ages. He said, when you are inspired, that is, in spirit, and remember, it is in the world of spirit, it is in the world of thoughts where we change, where we go to the place where we create anything we want for ourselves in our lives. So that remembering here, the theme is that you can't solve any problem that you might have in your life with the same mind that created it. So you're moving into a place now called spirit. That which is seen hath not come from that which doth appear. We're moving into the world of the invisible now. When you are inspired, and think about the moments in your life when you've had the most inspiration, inspirado. You... You lose any touch of fatigue. I have gone and been inspired at moments in my life when uh, I have written for almost 24 straight hours without stopping, without, without eating, without uh, thinking about sleep. I just got into one of those modes, you know, what uh, we call a zone sometimes, where everything just flowed. When you are in that place, you, you transcend everything. And you don't think about, you don't worry about whether people are going to call you or not call you. You don't worry about your children. You don't worry about being sick. You don't think about the cold that you might have. You don't think about being tired and how much sleep you'll need. When you're inspired, you're in spirit. When you're in spirit, you're connected to your source. And now what you're doing is you're moving out of the mindset of inform or information, which is where all problems occur in the world of the physical, and you're shifting into the world of spirit. The softer you are, the less rigid you are, the more flexible you are as a person, the more you can accomplish. And this is a great way to practice in parenting as well. And this idea that a rigid thought how many times have you heard this idea that if I tell you something, I'm going to stay consistent with it. We have a set of rules, these are the rules, and we'll do it this way. In the Tao it says the more rules you make, the more rule breakers you create. <laughs> it's true. The more rules you have in your house about how everything has to go. We had in our house, my wife would have a big jar of M&Ms. Peanuts, you know, different, they, with all these different multicolored ones. And, so, and the kids in our house, because we didn't feed them sugar and we didn't give them sodas and stuff like that. So they, you know, they were just more like a decoration. Every once in a while someone would take them. They'd hardly ever be replaced. Now when we had kids come over to our house who weren't ever allowed to have such horrible things, you should have seen their behavior. You know, they would scoop them up, they'd be putting them in their pockets, and they'd get their purses, and they'd open it up. And, you know, the whole thing would be empty. I'd say, well, what are you doing? He said, well, well you, you mean you could just have these whenever you want them? I said, well, we don't really have any rules about that. It's just, uh, uh, it's not something that we encourage or discourage. It's just there. It's like Emerson had a wonderful line. He said, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. A foolish consistency, a rigid consistency. So that there are many people who will say, if I say it on Monday, 
you can be absolutely certain that on Wednesday I'm going to believe the same thing, regardless of what might happen on Tuesday. <laughs> now Tuesday might have something real that you might want to be changing your mind. You might want to say, you know, I thought that this time, but now I've seen this, and now we can shift. And you can see how this can become when, and so much about the Tao is on leadership. Leadership in the family, leadership in the community, leadership geopolitically. Less rigidity, more openness, more willingness to listen and say, I changed my mind. <laughs> because a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. And what I believed on Wednesday has changed because of what happened on Tuesday. Now, another important thing to say to your children, to your friends, to your lover, to your spouses, to whomever, to the people you work with, words that we're so terrified to say, but which give us a sense of living with the Tao. I don't know. I don't know. I'll look it up. Say it. I don't know. It doesn't hurt. Say it again. I don't know. Isn't it fearful? I mean, so many people, and it's like very freeing, because my kids call, ask me something, and I say, I don't know. They say, Dad, you know everything. You know everything. I say, well, I don't know that, and uh, I'll look it up, or we'll try to find an answer to that, but I don't quite know. I know that um, even, you know, I spent 20 years running and I ran every day for 20 years, for 22 years, without missing a day. Eight miles. Never missed a day. That's rigid. All right? Some call that obsessive. <laughs> but you brush your teeth every day, I used to say, and you don't call that obsessive. And uh, you go to the bathroom every day, and you don't say, well, he's obsessively doing that again today. You don't do that. You just... But anyway, what I learned is that in, even in the world of exercise, there are certain things that are built in to make us rigid, to make us stiff, to make us hard. And we lift, and we run, and we kick, and uh, we, this is what we call working out. There's another kind of working out that is ancient. It goes back to the time of Lao Tzu and before, which is called yoga. And yoga means union. It means union with your source. And when you do yoga, you can stay in the same place. You can do the equivalent of eight miles. When I used to run eight miles, I had to run four miles that way, turn around, four miles back, and I'd be sweating. Now I can do yoga, and I can just stand in one place, and in 90 minutes, by being supple, by making myself stretch, by not being hard and rigid, I can, you know, I can get that out there, I can get that leg up, I can do these kinds of things, and 90, and 90 minutes later, you know, it's like I'm totally sweating, and, so, and I feel so different. I used to, when I would go out at night, to eat or something after running so many miles, running marathons and doing those things, I'd go to get up and it would be, okay, it's going to take a little while, because <laughs> everything was so like that. That doesn't happen anymore because I've given up hard. I've given up being rigid and substituted it for being supple, for being flexible, for living a life in which I don't have to always be so fierce. Listen to this verse of the Tao Te Ching. It's one of my all-time favorites, verse number 76. A man is born gentle and weak. At his death, he becomes hard and stiff. All things, including the grass and the trees, are soft and pliable in life, dry and brittle in death. Stiffness is thus a companion in death. Flexibility is a companion in life. And it's not just for how you exercise, it's how you think, how you think. In order to cultivate your witness, you need to learn to observe your reactions in order to go beyond them. It is the going beyond that is the crux of the sacred quest. There are many ways that you can use the observation process. Here are a couple of them that are very important. The first is observing your body. This is one of the areas of being the witness that most of us have practiced somewhat. In general, we allow our body to function without interference. We are aware that there is the body and that there is a ghost in the machine, if you will. For as long as you can remember, you have been observing this phenomenon of a body. 
It is also true that you know that the entity that is doing the observing is removed in some dramatic way from that which it is witnessing. As you are listening to these words, you are allowing your body to act out its destiny without your meddling. You are not busy beating your heart or filling your lungs or oxygenating your blood supply or circulating your vital fluids. You allow your body to operate itself and you allow another part of you to know the way of being the divine, quiet, non-interfering observer. This way has served you well. By just observing your body and detaching yourself from its functioning, it works as perfectly as it was ordained to. If you were constantly monitoring and attempting to control your bodily functions, you would be unduly attached to its outcome and you would inhibit its natural functions. The times in your life when you worry or interfere with the natural functions of your body are the times when you find it breaking down. Feed your body the wrong foods and it will respond with lethargy and disease. Fail to exercise it and it will become overweight and groggy. Ignore its needs for fresh air and healthy environment and it will fall into disrepair. Feed it narcotic substances or artificial drugs and it will react with violent symptoms. When your body is in any state of disrepair from being overweight to having back pains or nervousness or influenza or cancer or anything that is not the way of perfect health that your body knows at the cellular and genetic levels, then you are being called back to the position of loving witness. The second way of observing is called observing your mind. Your mind is filled with thousands of thoughts every day. They come and they go like trains in a terminal. One enters, another takes its place, one exits and along comes another. First you want to watch your thoughts. Then you want to watch yourself watching your thoughts. Here is the door to the inner space where, free from all thoughts, you experience the bliss and the freedom that transport you directly to your higher self. The simple exercise of watching your mind manufacturing its thoughts will eventually cause unwanted, unnecessary, erroneous thoughts to dissolve. In the process of cultivating the witness, you learn to quiet your mind, to take inventory, and dispose of or reassign thoughts that generate self-defeating or ego-centered responses. In this simple process, you also come to know your spiritual self. Ego-generated thoughts play a huge role in creating the world that the ego wishes to create. Each of my thoughts seem to demand it be considered the most important. Troubles begin with a thought that you put into your mind and allow it to fester to the point of anxiety. The anxiety begins to manifest in your life in physically destructive ways, which we call things like arthritis, high blood pressure, and career cardiacs. The loving, non-judgmental energy received from the observer or the witness will allow these thoughts to flow in and out as naturally as the ocean tides. Tides in, tides out. Thoughts in, thoughts out. You will learn to be a witness to your thoughts in the same way that you observe the tide. And the process will cleanse and redistribute and remove thoughts in much the same way as the driftwood on the beach. What remains is generally quite pleasing. Witnessing your thoughts will take some practice. With proficiency comes wonder and delight. Trauma is dissolved in the thinking stage and prevented from manifesting into your everyday world. Begin to notice the noticer. As you take note of your worlds, both inner and outer, begin to familiarize yourself with the noticer who is behind that which is being noticed. If you do this several times each day, you will begin to see that you are much more than just a body and mind going through the program motions of your life. Your realization of your true self as the witness behind that which is being witnessed will bring you a new dimension of creativity and bliss. Try on this exercise. Think of something that has been bothering you for a long period of time. Now go to a quiet place and close your eyes. Just see the problem surfacing on the blank screen in your consciousness. Notice all aspects of the problem, what it looks like, when it shows up, what you feel when it is on your mind, the pain and the fear that you have when it is present, how you have dealt with it unsuccessfully in the past. Think of everything that you can which is related to the problem. Then, detach yourself in your mind from the problem. Just allow it to sit there on the screen of your mind. Look at it from the viewpoint of the compassionate witness who just non-judgmentally notices the screen. Watch it like a movie allowing it to change in whatever way it does, just observe it with loving permission for it to do whatever it wants to do. You will see it change and fade in and out of awareness. With each change or movement on the screen, remain in the caring witness mode of knowing the energy will do what it will and will also be accompanied by the loving energy from the witness. Often, just this act of observation will result in a feeling of the problem having dissipated. 
If that happens, observe that also from the position of caring observer. I once practiced this act of observation when I was injured and unable to play tennis. I reacted at first to the pain in my foot with statements like, this injury is keeping me from doing what I want to do and I'm really upset about it. I found that no matter what I tried, the pain persisted and I was unable to pivot and consequently had to discontinue an activity that I loved. I then took the witness stance. I no longer saw myself as having an injury. I attributed the pain only to my body and not to me. I witnessed the entire thing and merely watched it. I lovingly witnessed the pain, the way it showed up, my feelings of frustration about it, the color of the swelling, everything. But I refused to think of it as mine. It was only my body's problem. The very same day that I did this, the entire discomfort disappeared. I mean, it was gone from my body. I had put my attention on what was occurring and detached myself from it. And in what seemed like a few hours, I no longer had the pain and I was playing tennis as if I had never experienced any injury at all. In order to know the benefit of witnessing, you will have to banish the doubt about this as something that will work for you. Remember, you have been conditioned to believe that your body is the essence of your humanity. You've been taught to tackle problems with your physical and intellectual apparatus, not your higher self. Practice new self-talk sentences to replace your old identification with your physical body. I am that which owns this body. I am not the body itself. I can't be reached if you come to me with hatred or anger. I cannot worry when I refuse to be the worrier and simply observe that worrier and the worries. Self-talk sentences will keep you centered on your spiritual domain. You will find that many things that you worried about or experienced in a negative fashion are slowly beginning to diminish from your life. Let's go for a moment to our dream. And just assume that we're going to have a dream. We're in bed. And let me ask you this question. This is a question I like to ask for you to just contemplate, one of those sort of cones. When you go to sleep at night and enter your dream state, what happens to the bed? Just think about that. What happens to the bed? Now you're in your dream, okay? So just propel yourself into a dream state. And in your dream, you notice, oh, let's say you're over here, and you're in a room. And in this room, you look across the room, and you notice that there's a podium in the room. And it has some objects on it. Now, you're in your dream. So in the state of dream consciousness, you say to yourself, I would like to examine that podium more closely. How do you do it in your dream? How do you examine it more closely in your dream state? Do you get out of bed? Is there a bed? Now, we're talking about one-third of your life here, folks, okay? One-third of your life. As Lao Tzu said, I went to sleep and dreamt that I was a butterfly. Then I woke up, and now I don't know. Am I a man who dreamt he was a butterfly, or am I a butterfly who's dreaming that he's a man? <laughs> so in your dream state, do you get up out of bed, keep it right over there, say, excuse me, honey, uh, wait, uh, get up, and walk over and say, oh, here, oh, there's a galley of a new book, and there's a pen here, and there's a glass of water, I think I'll have a drink of that. There's a microphone stand, there's things. Do you do that? No, you don't do that. Because you enter your dream without any doubt. So what you do in your dream state is, are you ready? Shoo! Stay alert. <laughs> and you bring it to you, don't you? In your dream state. Why? Because you have the power of your intention, can have an idea, and whatever you need for the fulfillment of your dream, you bring to you. Here it is. Here it is. Whatever you need. So you're 20 years old in your dream, and you need a jerk to be married to for the next 20 years. There he is. Isn't that great? You need a Maserati? There it is. Whatever you need for the dream, you bring to it. Then you leave the dream and you come into waking consciousness. And now you look back on the dream and you now have a whole new set of things that you've introduced. And that set of things is called doubt. 
And the second key to higher awareness, which I'll get to shortly, is called banishing the doubt, but it's, it's connected here. As you enter your dream state, you enter without any doubt about your capacity to do anything. So you can fly, you can jump over trees, you can be young again, you can uh, transcend death, you can stay underwater, you can, do, you can to communicate telepathically with anyone that you want to, right? You have all of these incredible powers. And if someone has died and you want them back, you bring them back. If you need to be 12 again, and then you come into this state and you say, I can't do any of those things because you're stuck in paradigms. And the paradigm says, you cannot change your shape. You can't shape shift. If you're a certain age, you're a certain age. You can't move yourself into, you can't be in more than one place at the same time, which you can do in your dream easily. You can't do those things. And one of the things I talk about in your sacred self is like learning to become a waking dreamer, to understand that you don't have to go to sleep in order to dream. So now you wake up, and what I'm suggesting to you is that this is also a dream, only it's a hundred-year dream. And in this hundred-year dream, everything that you can do in your eight-hour dream, you can do in this hundred-year dream. Everything. If you know better than to doubt it and if you get rid of the paradigms that muck up your life you have the capacity but the minute that you introduce doubt into it like that poem that I started out real magic which is really my effort to write about how to manifest miracles in your life from Samuel Taylor Coleridge he said what if you slept and what if in your sleep you dreamed? And what if in your dream you went to heaven and there picked a strange and wonderful flower? And what if when you awoke you held that flower in your hand? Ah, what then? Is it possible to bring something from a dream state into a waking state? Or is that part of a paradigm? And the tiniest smidgen of doubt that enters your consciousness is what you will act upon. Seven key little words from Proverbs, as you think, so shall you be. If you think that it's not possible, what you think about is what expands. Or as Emerson said, the, at the ancestor to every action is a thought. And the minute you have a doubtful thought in your consciousness, you will act upon that and manifest the fruit of that doubt and not be able to see it. You will not see it. The solution for me represents the ability to bring to your life something that can make these things called problems disappear, dissolve, and nullify. And that is what I spoke about when I opened up here a little while ago about energy. Energy comes in the form of fast and slow, high and low, and higher and faster energy nullifies lower and slower energy. A room full of darkness. Darkness is a lower and a slower energy, if you measure it, than is light. And when you bring light to the presence of a dark room, the darkness disappears. And that is a metaphor for every single one of the problems and concerns and struggles that you, fa that you are facing in your life. And way back, way back 800 years ago there lived a little man who gave up all of his possessions he lived in a little village in uh, in uh, Italy near Florence called Assisi and we named one of our most famous cities in America after him his name was Francesco or as he became known later after his passing Saint Francis of Assisi and I went to Assisi, and I had miracles that took place for me in visiting Assisi on several occasions. And St. Francis was one of these people who created a prayer that is perhaps the most uh, well-known prayer uh, on the planet today, certainly one of them. How can I become an instrument of thy peace? The ego is the part of us that wants to be at war, that wants to defeat, that wants to collect, that wants to be better than, that wants to always get more. 
the sacred or the highest part of ourselves is the part of us that just wants to be at peace. How can I become an instrument of peace? Not someone who's looking for peace, but someone who delivers it. There are opportunities every day. I was in a gas station just a few days ago, and in this gas station they had a car wash. And there was a young boy, he was uh, maybe 18 or 19 years old, and he didn't speak English very well, and he couldn't figure out how to work the car wash. Uh, and he had put two dollars in, and apparently it required three dollars. And he was in there waiting to uh, pay for his, uh, his car wash and trying to get an answer to why he couldn't get it to work. And I had just gotten some gasoline, and I walked in, and there was this man behind the counter berating this young boy and humiliating him and talking to him. And because he didn't understand the language, he talked louder to him. You know how people do that? You know, if, if someone doesn't understand you, you say, what I said is, and they say, I don't understand, and then you say it even louder. Um, well, that's what they were, he was doing to this young boy. And, he was, and I saw this is an opportunity right here in this instant to be an instrument of peace. And I put my arm around the young man, and I said, come with me. And I walked out to the machine, and I took a dollar, uh, and I put it in the, and, and he walked away, and he was just so happy. One tiny little incident. These kinds of things, I suggest to you that you take this day and look for five occasions to be an instrument of peace. And you'll find one when you're on your way home, on the freeway. You'll find somebody who isn't going to let you get in. You find somebody who doesn't want to let you pass. And instead of, uh, you know, giving them a hard time or being angry at them, try sending something called peace their way. There's a wonderful line that I have on the dashboard of my car. It says, I can choose peace rather than this. And it's always a reminder that no matter how I'm experiencing, what I'm experiencing in my life, I want to be an instrument of peace. It's been said that the three most difficult things to do in the world are this. The first is to send love in response to hatred. The second is to defend the absent. That is, whoever's being gossiped about, you become their spokesperson. I do this with my children all the time when they're all saying this and that. She said that and he said that. I'll say, excuse me, but who is defending the absent person here? Well, why should anybody defend her? I'll say, well, I'll just take her position right now if you don't mind. <laughs> and the third is to admit when you were wrong. And it doesn't mean necessarily to say, I just made a mistake. It means to say, I have been making the wrong kinds of choices in my life with my mind. I've been putting my attention on what I don't want, on what others want for me, on what the world ought to be, on what it used to be, and I can't understand why it just keeps showing up, what I don't want, what others want for me, what I despise. I have to admit, almost I have to rewrite my agreement with reality. And so much of what St. Francis was speaking about back in the 13th century, about because he was a man who was ridiculed wherever he went and he was just out there trying to teach people to bring a hot the solution spiritual solution to your problems if hatred is existing in your world that's an energy field it's a lower and a slow energy than the energy of love if you can bring love to the presence of that hatred it will be nullified just as if you were bringing light to darkness it, but for most of us, what we do when we see hatred is we respond in kind to that hatred. Whatever choice you make in every interaction you have, make the choice to be at peace, your sacred or higher self says. Whereas your ego says, oh, no, 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 no. It's much more important to be right. And so we find people in relationships struggling, struggling a lot. And one of the things that they struggle about is who's right and who's wrong. Most of the fights that you have in your relationships really basically, when you, it's oftentimes you forget the details, but it's basically about who's right and who's wrong. So that if you want to have your higher or your sacred part of you ruling in your life, I suggest this to you. Practice being kind rather than right. When you have the choice, and you have the choice in your relationships with your spouse and your ex-spouse, with your parents, with your grandparents, with your in-laws, with strangers on the freeway, with flight attendants, with waiters, with whomever you interact, if you can just subdue this ego part of you which says, it's important for me to be right, which will introduce you to stress and anxiety and fear and so much of the stuff that I talked about earlier. 
and instead say, how can I suspend this part of me and allow the, allow the part of me that wants to be at peace, that wants to be happy, that wants to be fulfilled. And if I said to you, I'm going to give you a magic wand, and with this magic wand, I am going to allow you to just wave it and get anything that you want. Whatever you want. You can have this, you can have this car, you can have this, these uh, nice clothes over here, you can have this home, whatever it is. Or I said to you, in lieu of that, I'm going to give you another wand, and you can wave this, and for every moment for the rest of your life, you'll be at peace. Whatever comes along, you'll be able to choose peace. And basically, we know that we're only here for a very short time. And being able to choose peace, which is what the sacred part of you begs you, the higher self. Once you get that, you begin to shift away and you stop telling yourself that the people who are close to me in relationship with me are the people who don't belong there. I remember my wife and I, we often talk about this and we, we, we've been together a long time. We've had many children together and we have a very wonderful, loving relationship. Thank you. <laughs> but we'd often, and one time I said to her or she said to me, you know, we love each other, but this doesn't sound like love. It does, sometimes the way we talk to each other doesn't sound like love. Let's practice, let's practice with each other, being kind rather than being right. And it was transformative that, that when we had that walk. That, and doing that with your children and doing that with a waiter. I mean, a waiter who comes to you and is like, you know, hassled and frazzled and has been busy and all of that, and your ego says, wait a minute, I'm here and I'm important, and I have a right to be served, and I have a right to be served now. That's the ego part of you. If, this, if you can suspend that and say, you know, you are a lucky man tonight. You've got somebody who's dealing from his sacred self. <laughs> and I understand. And you take your time. And you come to me. And you bring it at your convenience, whenever you can. I'm willing to, I'm willing to suspend my... And you know what? You'll get served so fast. <laughs> and with such gratitude. Just for being kind. If you practice it. Every single one of us are in relationship, whether it's with our husbands and wives, with our ex-husbands and wives, with our children, our grandchildren, whether it's with people we drive along the freeway next to, whether it's with waiters and waitresses or baggage handlers or flight attendants or uh, people that we are in line to get into the movie. We're all in relationships and we interact with each other all the time. And probably the best lesson that I've ever learned in my life about how to be in a relationship in a way which is powerful and happy and fulfilling is to remember this sentence. When you have a choice, and you always do, to be right or to be kind, start picking kind. The ego part of us wants to be right. How dare you not serve me as fast as I think I deserve to be served? How dare you say something to me? And immediately we want to make that other person wrong and make ourselves right. But there's a part of each one of us that wants to be happy, wants to be at peace. And that part of us says, it doesn't matter whether you're right. It doesn't matter about your ego. All you want is to be at peace. So pick kind. This kind of an attitude, if we had more of this, not only in our own personal lives, would we improve virtually every relationship we have with all of the people closest to us and all of the strangers we interact with. But on our planet as well, we would begin to understand the wisdom that on a round planet, there's no choosing up sides that we're all one. We're all breathing the same air. We're all drinking the same water. We're all being warmed by the same sun. And as they say, as the Native Americans used to say, no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. It applies in your relationships and it applies as a people as well. You begin to sense there's trouble ahead. And so you look at a group of people that are standing on a corner and you think that could be trouble. And your intuition says, run around them rather than next to them. And you run and you avoid that. And something tells you when you're walking out of a parking lot, there's some intuitive sense that says, I think I should have somebody accompany me when I'm doing this. And you listen to that intu intuition. Sometimes it isn't there and it's not necessary. When it's there, you pay attention. You begin, synchronicity isn't any more confusing 
than the thought that exists between a mother and her baby. It's not any more difficult to understand than the idea of a remote control in your television set. And when we then have these synchronistic events in which we access our intuition and what I'm suggesting is that when you reach these higher frequencies, intuition, insight, creativity, all of these things become negotiable. You can access them. You have the knowing. Because when you form a picture in your head of what you would like to attract into your life, you can begin to attract abundance, and virtually anything else that you put your attention on. It's a law of the universe. Get that picture. See yourself as if you already are what you'd like to become. And every great artist, every great thinker is able to do just that. They have been able to see themselves as completing something. Do you know how difficult it is for so many people who get into a doctoral program? I think the statistics are that out of every 10 people admitted into a PhD program, one completes it. Nine out of 10 never complete it because they can't picture themselves writing a dissertation. The reason that I knew when I entered a doctoral program and was told that nine out of 10 don't complete it, I already saw myself as having my doctorate. And I just knew that that was something that I, was, I had to do. And I suggest that uh, there are people right in here, there are physicians in here, who uh, probably entered medical school. There's a lady right here in the front who uh, entered medical school. How many women who enter medical school complete the entire process and become medical doctors and have a practice? It's getting higher, but the statistics are against you as you enter something like that. But if you see yourself as having a practice, you see yourself as a healer, you see yourself as someone who is capable of becoming a doctor or anything else in your life. If you see it and get that picture, and I can't tell you, I try to teach this to my children, my daughter who wants to sing, I just said, sing. See yourself as a singer. Get that picture, and no matter what comes your way, don't ever let anybody ever tell you that it won't happen. You can let them tell you, and all you have to do is use that as a way to step into the gap and then out of the gap over here into the world of spirit and bring that energy, that energy of knowing, that energy of insight, that energy of intuition. Are you listening, Jennifer? <laughs> because if you have that picture, there's nothing that can stop you. And you don't evaluate whether or not you are successful on the basis of whether people buy your CDs. That's the biggest mistake you could make. Or whether people read your books. Or whether people want to come and hear your lectures or buy your tapes. You don't do it that way. You evaluate whether or not you are a success by being one of those people who's on the road that's hardly ever crowded and enjoying everything that they do because they're seeing themselves as someone who couldn't be any place else. And you no longer find enlightenment through suffering. You no longer find enlightenment through having an awareness in the moment of what it is that you need to do to learn the lesson that's happening for you right now. You are now a person who's out in front of yourself and you see it coming. And that makes you a master who lives coincidences, not in the sense of them being accidents, but having a perfect fit.